Hello, and this is Adam coming from the Philosopher's Corner on this fine Wednesday morning. So this is three ways to fight the state for the normal person. Um, number three, let's just crack right into it. Number three is peaceful parenting. Um, this is in no particular order. It's just three practical ways that the individual themselves can fight statism. Peaceful parenting, obviously, um, absolutely crucial. Kind of a, uh, if if the term even exists, kind of a, a positive eugenics. So what we're basically advocating is peaceful parenting. So teaching kids the art of negotiation, teaching kids that to resolve disputes, we don't use force. Um, we use um, incentives, disincentives, um, reward, rewards, punishment, um, ostracism. No physical violence. It just doesn't work. It, it teaches the wrong perspective on life it frames the child in the status perspective because obviously statism is defined as the initiation of the use of force and if you frame the child in that mentality to begin with it's much easier to ram the jack into the back of their head so that they're stuck within the statist matrix for the rest of their life they inherently believe that force is the compelling factor in any situation that, that should need negotiation so yes peaceful parenting definitely extremely important this is something that's in in our direct control if we have children um so it's just something that's a no-brainer really My, peaceful parenting the next generation if we had an entire generation of people adopting this philosophy with in in, in their child's upbringing i think we would have a voluntary society follow extremely quickly so second is, it sounds like a cliche, but be the change that you want to be. It sounds very political, but it isn't. It's what I essentially mean is, is that just talk to people, talk to people about anarchism or talk to people about um, volunteerism, ask them questions. I mean, do you consider taxation to be a free choice? Uh, <laughs> what do you think the state is? Ask them what the state is. Ask them what their money is. I'll ask them these questions. Um, people do respond. I've, I've found if you talk to people about these things, if you make them think, there's a little spark of, oh, yeah, I've never really thought about that. Uh, often people have just been exposed to this thing. It's not that they're not critical thinkers in and of itself. It's that they've never been exposed to these kinds of questioning. And so it's just a case of using the knowledge that we have to to spread ideas in things like um, podcasts, things like this video. Um, I've written a book, so um, talking to other anarchists and trying to spread the idea, ideas of, of freedom and volunteerism about. So yeah, it's such a simple thing, but it's highly effective. You, could, you have direct control over this kind of thing. Don't be afraid. Um, you can either take the circuitous route and probably the much more subtle route, um, which when my discussion with um, with Danilo and Peaceful um, Anarchy, he was saying that he asked questions, kind of like the Socratic method, if you like, or do you, do you believe um, taxation is good? And just sort of wheeling around to the actual point and then say, oh yeah, by the way, I'm, I'm an anarchist, or let them derive that fact from the questioning itself. And then finally, and I can't stress this enough, don't vote. <laughs> I know I've got a bit of a of a gripe about this, but just don't vote. Um, I think most people take this for granted anyway. A lot of people are certainly apathetic to the idea of voting. Uh, they're becoming very aware that it doesn't matter who you vote for, Republican, Democrat, Conservative or Labour, it doesn't make a, an essential difference. They both still use the initiation of the use of force. They're both covet and want the well covet the levers of the state and they're both redistributing wealth and there's the same essential claims are there so they're still claiming your body they're still claiming dominion over you you don't own yourself in this system there is an implicit claim on your life which um if you read my book i explain all this um that people are inherently self-owning they own themselves and their actions we all accept this and yet there's this glaring contradiction where the statists say well actually you're responsible for your actions, but we're, we also claim the right to conscript you. We also claim the right to take your money. <laughs> we just call it taxation. So, yeah, those are the three main ways, very briefly, as to how you can directly fight the state. Peaceful parenting, absolutely crucial. Spread of knowledge, um, such a simple thing. 
uh, just talk to people, question them, question their assumptions about how society functions, about how things can be provided um, in society. Do we need a state to provide all these things? No. And then finally, just don't vote. Encourage people not to vote. Um, they're all the same. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. So three ways you can fight the state. And I encourage you to embrace, embrace these ways. Thank you very much. Um, if you the if you find this content interesting, um, if you find this content um, enlightening, please subscribe and like. It really helps me. Um, the book is now available on Amazon. The Declaration of the Self on the Abolition of the State. Uh, my website is www.clarkad.co.uk. All links at the end of the video. Um, many more videos coming. Um, thank you very much, and I shall see you later. My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? by only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff, cause folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on, on the Voluntary Virtues Network on thesseedsofliberty.com or uh, the solpodcast.org and uh, the Conscious Resistance Network. Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I am delighted to have on uh, Adam Clark coming in from England. He is an author uh, and an um, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and his website is uh, www.clarkad.co.uk, and his book is entitled On the Declaration of the Self. So it's kind of a spinoff of the Declaration of Independence, but anarcho-capitalist version. <laughs> and uh, you can find him on Facebook uh, under Adam Clark. It's his personal uh, profile. And then I guess for his um, uh, his book is is Me Too, M-E number two. And um, he is not associated with the Me Too movement, so don't ask him if he's a feminist. <laughs> 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 no. Uh, no. On, on Twitter, you can find him at Clark16. Uh, and then on YouTube, his uh, YouTube channel is A.D. Clark. So we're going to talk a little bit about his path to volunteerism and anarcho-capitalism, how he came to this philosophy, and we're going to get into his book and uh, what that's all about because it's a fascinating read. So, Adam, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you messaged me uh, was it a couple months ago about your book, yeah. and you sent <laughs> it to me very graciously. And uh, you know, delightful book. I love your style. Um, you know, I appreciate good writing because I too, I'm not an author, but I have written quite a bit um you know articles and stuff like that and uh you know i wrote like um i guess you can say treatises for myself um you know in high school apart from school of course apart from school yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah and i love to write you know i feel very comfortable with the written word so when i when i find someone who you know is able to write eloquently and and concisely and direct because you know it, it's funny with writing people you know when you first start writing people think that if you just you know bombard the reader with a bunch of adjectives that's yeah. good that's good writing you know and and i think i initially wrote like that but then as i as i matured as a writer i slowly was distilling my writing into its most 
you know, essential ideas and components. Like, how do you, how can you get across your idea in the fewest words possible? That's my goal when I write, and I think I get that same vibe with you. So, uh, so yeah. So please, before we get into that, um, uh, get into how you came to uh, this philosophy of volunteerism and uh, anarcho-capitalism. I would say the definitely the flashpoint of it all was the um, I'll be very boring uh, the UK general election in 2010. <laughs> so basically, what happened was there was the a coalition was formed for the first time in a very long time in this country. So usually it's red, blue, red, blue, kind of like Republican, Democrat, but um, Tory and Labour. And what happened in that year was that um, one of the smaller parties called the Liberal Democrats. Um, joined with one of the major parties and basically if you're a smaller party you just you kind of like um, spout a lot of nonsense on the campaign don't you say oh we're going to do this um, we're going to do that and they promised to um, abolish tuition fees for university students and um, basically they didn't think they was going to get into power they got into power and instead of abolishing tuition fees um, they tripled them so <laughs> complete reversal of what they did hmm. um and that is kind of shattering when you when you believe in something and i was still as very much a status back then i believed in all uh, all, all sorts of crazy stuff <laughs> and um yeah it's just shattering isn't it and then when they when someone does something like that just a, a complete 180 degree turn it, it puts your views into perspective and you think well what are these people actually doing this for <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, it actually, that reminds me of an analogy where it's like, it's not only that they don't do what they said they're going to do, but they hurt people and they don't do it and they hurt people. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like, they, you know, somebody sells you a car and not only does it not drive, but when you turn the ignition, it explodes and then you die. <laughs> yeah. <That's> it, yeah. <laughs> so to me, that's the analogy of the state. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not just that it fails. It's that also that it hurts people in the process of failing. Yeah. It doesn't just hurt you; it breaks every bone in your body yeah. while it does it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, crazy. I mean, to me, um, I didn't really, um, I wasn't really political at all. Um, my, I, I, my parents, my family was more Democrat, and so I voted for Obama in 2008 just because my pa- my mother said vote for Obama. I didn't really care, so I did. But after that. I, uh, you know, atoned for my sins and I never voted again. So, <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't advocate voting basically at all. Um, no. but, um, but yeah, so, so politics for me really didn't really get me into it that much more. I think I say more reading of economics and, um, understanding history, you know, Tom Woods and things like that. And the, and the philosophy of volunteerism. I love philosophy and economics. That's what I love more, more than hearing mm. these political clowns and, you know, um, con men talk, you know, to me, that's just like, I don't know. It's just like hearing liars talk. Like how can you believe a word that they say? You know, that's, that's kind of people do though. That's, that's the trouble where people do. And because they're such, they're, they're very skilled in rhetoric. They're very skilled in the way they present themselves. It's, it's enough to fool people, isn't it? Yeah. 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 They say like, uh, you know, the amateur, um, the amateur thief, um, is the person that like robs people at gunpoint. Right, um, or robs their house, right, or steals their car, and then you got the next level up, which is the <laughs> the expert, right, which is like the mafia, we, we, you know, they control their block, and uh, and they make a kind of a bus- kind of like a quasi business, right, out of out of extorting people, and then you got yeah. the godlike level, which is like the politician, which is like not only are they stealing from people, but they have actually convinced the population that what they're doing is legitimate and necessary for yeah, humanity for civilization <laughs> and so they've institutionalized yeah. the process they, yeah. they, they've, yeah. they've not only have, have they convinced people uh, not not only are they doing it but they're convincing people that it's a virtue it's a good at the same time so yeah it's that's the crazy thing about it it's yeah. like a, a, a mass stockholm syndrome <laughs> yeah carrying, carrying on yeah because they have the control of the education system as well as the media. The, the media right and you know tertiary education as well and so, you know, once you have that, like, how do you, how do people break free of that? How does independent thought nurtured and uh, encouraged, um, you know, not really, you know, it's the people, you know, like you and me that actually think differently that are shunned from those institutions <laughs> and that are yeah. cast, cast out, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no, it, it, I mean, 
the the last hope i think at the moment for the spread of knowledge and this this is a key ingredient in my book for the, the remedy for fight, fighting back statism trying to break the cycle of the state renewal and state death you know revolution and that kind of thing right. the one about the key aspect of defeating it is the spread of knowledge and the internet really is the the last great hope isn't it really because like you said um there's no way an anarchist is going to publish a paper in in a well they're very rare let's say mm. in in any kind of faculty in any university right, um, right. Or, or speak on cnn or anything like that it's, they wouldn't be given the time so yeah the people like us like you say very important that's why i'm doing it <laughs> yeah very rare and and like you said the internet is the savior and uh and i i always make the analogy of the Gutenberg press in the in the 15th century, how that revolutionized the spread of knowledge just by, you know, mass printing of books, and also, you know, I think they um, um, translated the Bible. Was it from Latin into like more? Um, uh, John Wycliffe, I think. R- John right. Wycliffe, was it? Oh, was it? Uh, yeah. Uh, who, who, tra- uh, who translated, translated the Bible from Latin? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, tr- translated the Bible from Latin into English. I, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eng- was- English and, and and every other you know provincial language. You know, so people, common people, can understand it. It's not just yeah. it's not just knowledge reserved for the clergy and aristocracy. Um, and yeah. and so the same thing with the internet. You know, the mass proliferation of knowledge is a beautiful thing, and uh, is is what's helping people to realize you know the chains and the um and the cages that they that they've been living in right um you know when you when you can read about new ideas and think about things in different perspectives you you kind of understand like wait a minute um you know i i can do a lot of things but you know you know you we still can't say that we're free in 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 the in the purest sense you know uh, so yeah, so please get into your book and uh, and what that's about. Maybe maybe why you wrote it, how, how you came to writing it, and and uh, and, and get into uh, you know summarize what, what's about. So I suppose I I just wanted to do something. I don't want to be one of these people that's um, always badgering my friends or badgering my family, saying, "Well, <laughs> you, you do you do know taxation is is forced, don't you? Expect you don't. Right. Oh, we pay taxes by choice. No, you don't. I just wanted to sort of concisely put all of these. All of these observations, these common sense observations, into like like you said earlier, like a simple format. So it's just it's just easy to go through. So just to do something, to be honest, just to rather than just sit around and complain about it, I'd rather actually actively do make make YouTube videos, um, write a book, uh, talk to good people like yourself, um, just just actually do something. So that was the main impetus, I suppose, for for um, writing the book. Um, what it's about, um, there's two main aspects to it. Like I say, um, it's just explaining how we don't we don't need these people. Uh, we don't need a state. Um, uh, everything can be provided privately. Everything can be provided by a free market. It's just cutting through these different what this miasma of um, these different kind of um, misconceptions that people have about the nature of people and society and how. We don't need the state, yeah, really, to provide these public goods. It's just a myth. <laughs> yeah, trying yeah. to cut through the indoctrination. And let me ask you, what um, what books and uh, personalities or YouTube uh, channels have you have you found most influential to you in your learning and development? I'd, I'd say quite easily, um, Stefan Molyneux, definitely um, very big influence of. I uh, remember I recall a video, the story of a story of your enslavement. Yeah, right. That's right. very big, big video, isn't it? Yeah. That's quite eye opening when you watch that. <laughs> so, yeah, tax think, livestock. I think that's his most uh, watched video, like of all time, of his all all of his videos. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. and he, he done a lot of early videos as well. You know, with the red background. Yeah, where he's saying, um, right. "Don't vote. This is why you shouldn't vote." Right. And you think, "Well, of course you got to vote," but then he explains why it's. It's futile, really, to vote. Right, right, right. right. And, and books? Any, any books that that really influenced you? Uh, favorite books, I'd say. I like listening to them as well. So I'd uh-huh. say Lysander Spooner, No Treason. Nice. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Anatomy of the State. Excellent. Definitely Excellent. <laughs> uh, highly recommend that. So yeah, but those two are the main sort of I'd say um, the main influences. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Murray Rothbard for me as as well really got me going. Yeah, Anatomy of the State, Case for the Hundred Percent Gold Dollar, What Has Government Done to Our Money, um, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, some Walter Block stuff. Um, you know, he wrote the um, 
Defending the Undefendables, which is a fascinating book uh, about the economics of um, you know scorned and reviled um, types of people, like that everybody is supposed to hate. You know, like the prostitute, like the slum lord, like like the yeah. what's it called, the ticket scalper, like the the blackmailer. <laughs> I find it I find that fascinating <laughs> because you, we're supposed to hate these people, yeah. but when you look at the essentials of what they do, a, a prostitute. Um, if, when you really think about it, they aren't that immoral. They're selling a resource that's theirs. Exactly. They're self-owning. They're selling their bodies to a willing buyer. So exactly. <laughs> sell a lot. Yeah, and, uh, and, I, I've kind of discussed this in the book as well. It's another it's two interesting terms that are very reviled is anarchist. When mm. you think of the, oh, he's an anarchist. Right. He wants to. Right. He wants the world to burn. Right. Capitalist. Right. That's another one. Sure. Sure mustache twirling monocle wearing um rich person who just wants the poor to starve that's another reviled sort of term isn't it uh, so, capitalism so so let me ask you when you introduce yourself to people i guess that you never met and um and you want to try to introduce them to this philosophy what do you call yourself i'm very direct i'll just say i'm an anarchist and when they say um, oh you do say okay when they come up yeah sure yeah i, I have a bit of fun with it i, <laughs> I say um <laughs> i say i'm an anarchist and when they come back with the usual connotations of the words uh, mm. of what you don't believe in in law or things like that i actually direct them to the original context of the word which is the original greek context yeah. anarchos yeah, yeah which is without rulers not right. without rules right, right. For, for those who don't know that's the original meaning of the word yeah so it's not that we it's not that i advocate a society without rules or without right. laws it's that like, I, like most anarchists, don't believe we need rulers. Right. It's, it's ridiculous. Of course yeah. there's rules. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's funny. Like um, amongst my friends, uh, like I, I'm a homeschooling father, and so we meet up with a lot of homeschooling families, and uh, and I kind of tend to hang out. They kind of tend to be like liberals, you know, mostly Bernie, support, Bernie Sanders supporters. I assume you know him, right? And, um, yeah. and so... I mean, they know I'm an anarchist, but I don't really push my philosophy onto them. You know, we're just we're cool, we're cool. But it's funny; they kind of make fun of me. Like we're in, like you know, we'd be like in a in maybe in a beach or or a park or something, and then we see some rules, and they're like, "Oh, Danilo doesn't follow any rules." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, uh, you know, when you get into you know places and institutions that have rules, you know, you got to abide by them. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, that's a common, very common misconception that uh, yeah. lawlessness you know it's got to be lawless um so yeah <laughs> no no sane person advocates that kind of society do you know it's just uh it's a no-brainer uh, 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 one of these days i'm just gonna turn around and go yeah that's exactly what i want so let's <laughs> let the lawlessness begin like, <laughs> got a molotov cocktail there <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's just saying oh let me get my molotov cocktail for my book bag hold on <laughs> i've got to get my leather jacket on this, uh... <laughs> or, or that movie have you seen uh, you heard about that movie the purge anarchy yes Oh. Uh, I've seen it. Is that the first purge? Is it? No, the, I don't think. It, I don't think it's the first one. But um, uh -huh. yeah, I think the first one was just like the purge. But but I think that that wasn't enough to scare Even people more. away from like anarchists. They had this. They had to make it the next one, the purge, and then with the word anarchy in the title. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's it's just just to sort of cement the image in people's minds. I think. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I saw one. I don't know if you know this woman, Julie Borowski. Uh, she's a libertarian and she makes uh, she's got a great YouTube uh, channel following and she made this one uh, post on Facebook. She said um, if you know to all of her fans, she's like, if if um, all laws were suspended for, let's say, 12 hours, what would you do? <laughs> and so the top comments with like the most likes, right, going from the t number one, the most likes is drink raw milk. <laughs> <laughs> collect rainwater <laughs> collect rainwater right. right that was one and then and then make an addition on my house and then open a lemonade stand <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Just stuff, need a license stuff like that you know it's like what do you really think people want to do you know do you really think everyone's a secret murderer or a rapist that wants you know for the first chance they get they want to take advantage <laughs> of you like is that what you is that what you really it's think it's absolutely people, you know? It is absolutely absurd. You get this idea that um, without without the thin blue line of the state, that everyone becomes a ravenous psychopath. There, there are other things that stop people randomly murder, just randomly murdering each other, isn't there? Yeah. There's a, 
there's more to humanity than than the state. This is quite. This is quite. Kind of reminds me of one of the other the, the other fallacies that you hear. When the do you know the one where people say, oh, "Well, we need a state because people are animals. People can't control their their base urges and their, and their violent <laughs> natures." Bit, well, hang on. Uh, these people are different species or something. They're yeah, people as exactly. well. So you're going to elevate these this subset of people who yeah. are even more psychopathic to a position where they can <laughs> exercise this enormous power over everyone else. <laughs> Have you read the book uh, "The Law" by Frederick Bastiat? No, I've, I've um, I was, I really want to read that book actually, yeah. but it's, it's um, yeah, highly short. recommended by many people. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, short little book, fascinating, excellent, you know, quick read, and yeah, he's got a great passage in there, j exactly about what you just said, which is basically uh -huh. like, um, you know, people tend to think that. You know, like like you said, you know, without the politicians, we would just be, you know, animals eating and you know, murdering each other. And so you say, do you think the politicians are made from a different clay than everyone else? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> this right? stuff, a lot of this stuff is just common sense. You see, a lot of I, I'm, I've got quite a lot of faith in in intelligence in in people in general. I think, where if it's just that they don't take the time to think about these things, a lot of a lot of things about self ownership and and non aggression principle and anarcho capitalism. A lot of it is just common sense. If you sit down and think about these things, um, you know, you, you you come to it organically, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, to us, I guess it seems much more self evident than to most other mm -hmm. people. We have to like really flesh it out and explain it. Um, yeah, sure. But. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's amazing the the kind of conclusion that people have, and I and I really do think that at, you know at its at the essence of the way most people think is fear. Like to me, that's what statism is 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 rooted in fear, fear of your neighbor, fear of the rich, fear of the poor, fear of illegals, right? Fear of you know black people, fear of white people, fear of men, <laughs> you know, fear of of Islam, fear of you know whatever name your religion. Um, and so to me, statism is fear fundamentally, you know, and and so the you know, one of my friends, Jim Limber Davis, also he's an author and he wrote his book called Liberty Defined. And one of his quotes that I always remembered is that when we, um, you know, when we fear, you know, that our neighbor will become a monster and then in so doing, we empower the state, we become monsters mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of that. I think it's Nietzsche, isn't it? A very similar kind of quote. He says, um, "Beware what, when you hunt for monsters, lest you become one yourself." It's yeah. a very similar quote, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just quite interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is. Um, yeah, it is. So, 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 let me ask you: How do you um, like, like? What are the steps you go through when you want to introduce someone to these ideas? How, what are the steps that you um, like? How do you explain it to a layman, to somebody who's just new to it? It's funny you should ask that because someone someone asked me the other day. They 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 were aware that I'm an anarchist because I'm uh -huh. like I say I'm very forward with it. Uh -huh. And they said, well, if you can explain anarchism in in, in one sentence, what would it be? And I said, <laughs> oh, two words: um, no guns. So get the gun out of my face. Uh -huh. If you re you remove force, uh -huh. yeah, anarchism is based is essentially the removal of force. So if 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 the situation is voluntary, mm -hmm. if there's no initiation of the use of force, then that's brilliant. You're looking at anarchism. There's, um, there's, it's not the negation of rules. It's just um, the negation of rulers. So, um, point the gun somewhere else. <laughs> point it at people that are attacking you. But uh, yeah, I, I just use the words no guns, and then I go from there. Really, a lot of people. You, it's very surprising. A lot of people have the foundations already yeah. in in their thought. A lot of people, um, even in our state societies today, avoid paying tax. Um, maybe for more nefarious reasons, but a lot of people hate paying tax. Everyone I ask say, oh, well, what do you think about taxes? And, and I had a question on Facebook saying uh, the other week, um, how much money would we actually save on tax? And I, I just had to say, look, I'm not an economist, I'm, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm, I'm going to guess your income would increase um, dramatically, uh, yeah. at least tenfold, right. if you weren't paying all these different taxes. Right. So the point being, all a lot of people have the foundations of it there. They're just... It's more like a lens. People like us are lenses. We focus the light rather than actually create the light, emit the light itself, hmm. to use a, an analogy. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and what's no fascinating... Yeah, and, and that is a good explanation. And what's fascinating is that, like, um, you know, in the time of the Revolutionary War here in, in, the, in the United States, 
um, they f- they rebelled against the British, yeah. uh, unlike the very negligible taxes. What is it, like a stamp tax and like tea tax and like that's it. They like had I don't know a couple of percent of their income um, stolen through taxes, and that was enough to cause a rebellion. And today, yeah. how much how much is you know <laughs> one third or perhaps including you know one third of your income, maybe including all the other taxes. Nearly yep. half of your wealth is taxed away, and yet people on Independence yeah, sure. in- Independence Day are celebrating their freedom. <laughs> I for, forget today. Um, you think about it, and um, you, you were talking about the United States. Um, just as recently after the revolution as, as the whiskey rebe- as the whiskey right. rebellion, right. or or the uh, <laughs> these early rebellions. Yeah. Um, some of the taxes were higher than under the British. <laughs> right, so exactly. it's, it's absolutely crazy. <laughs> this is like 10 years after the revolution. Yeah, so true. it's okay to rebel against the, the, and justly rebel against the authority of a foreign ruler. But mm. when the authority is domestic, suddenly it, magically it becomes totally legitimate. <laughs> it's very, that's fascinating to me. And I do refer to this in the book as well, the whiskey rebellion ah. and the, and the Boston um, incident as well. Um, it's fascinating to me how I don't see how it works. So you get a group of men, presumably, who who magically have the arbitrary authority. I'm talking about the founding fathers. Yeah. Um, to make up these rules. I mean, who gives them the authority to to, <laughs> to, to tell other Americans or other colonists at the time how to govern themselves? It's right, it's right. absolutely bizarre. Right. <laughs> this is not just the Americans. It's the same in every society. Um, Obviously, you get the social contract theory and all all yeah. that kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah. But um, I always just turn around in those situations and say, "Well, I never signed any contract, so <laughs> um, I don't see how these people have the right to govern how I live or um, dictate laws and things like that." Yeah, and it's amazing that in no other aspect of society of our lives do we um, accept this idea that everybody is beholden to this thing that none of us signed. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, your cell phone bill, you have a contract, right? Your maybe your water company, you have a contract. Maybe with, you know, I don't know, with your catering company, you have a contract. You have a contract with everybody that you do business with, <laughs> except with the state that's implied because a couple of old white rich guys, <laughs> you know, like uh, two centuries ago, sat down and sure. wrote something down and somehow that applies to me. <laughs> yeah. every, every every society is guilty of it you think if you think of my country um a french dude in 1066 <laughs> rampaged over the channel um i'm the king now right. killed the previous king right oh okay then well you you again you magically have the authority to create laws a bit but that's where it all stems from isn't it right. you see the norman conquest it is it, it's it's um most states are just founded in violence, aren't they? Uh, you can dress it up. You can you can put lipstick on a pig, but it doesn't mean it's going to be any more beautiful. <laughs> exactly. But it, but it would be a more like a rampaging, you know, crazy rabid pig. <laughs> yeah, sure. Especially now you you've held it down and applied lipstick to it. I, I expect it'd be quite mad. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Quite right about that. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So. Yeah, people. Yeah, it, it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge to spread these ideas. It's not easy. You know, we're we're functioning on uh, you know on the outskirts of poli- of what's politically acceptable. You know, yeah. um, code of behavior and poli- politically acceptable speech. You know, we're functioning completely outside of that. And um, and so, like when I talk to people, um, I don't mention the word anarchist at all. I kind of take a backdoor method. You know, I just say. I'm a voluntarist, and that like says, "Oh, what's that?" Or when somebody asks me, "What's my podcast?" I, I tell you know they find out if I have a podcast or YouTube channel. <laughs> I don't tell them the name yet because it's called Peter Anarchism. So I say, "All right, this is what I talk about." Right? I talk about homeschooling, unschooling, precious metals, central banking, non-aggression, um, philosophy, economics, history, morality, um, yeah. that kind of thing. You know, property rights, non-aggression, um, self ownership. Oh, and by the way. You know, and then and I say, you know, what's what's voluntary in your life? What would you say is a voluntary relationship, right? And so they say, well, my friends, my, um, you know, the businesses that I patronize, that kind of thing. You know, those are voluntary arrangements, right? My spouse, it's my voluntary arrangement. Employee, um, employer partnership. Empl- so yeah, right. Totally voluntary. Right, right. 
And and then I say, okay, now what's an involuntary? What's an example of an involuntary relationship? And because I I um I interact with a lot of homeschooling mothers, and so one of the first things they say is the public school system is involuntary. And I'm like, yes, you're right, exactly. Now expand that outwards. The public school system is just one part of the state. So it's the it's the idea of the state that is the um, that is the symbol of the violation of consent of the involuntary relationship in our lives, right? And so and so once they understand that, then they say, for that reason, if we are to stay logically consistent in advocating for voluntary interactions, we must um, we must ex- exempt the state state must not be part of that therefore you must be an anarchist if you if you advocate for voluntary interactions and so everyone's say, <laughs> if you i always say if if i get into a deep discussion with someone who's who's open-minded and, and a critical thinker I, I always say that everyone is an anarchist if you look if you read um <clears throat> excuse me stefan molyneux books um everyday anarchy I think uh, everyday anarchy's name one of them he actually makes his point that we all live personal lives of anarchy uh, as you say, we choose our spouses, we choose our friends. Um, the employer-employee relationship is voluntary. No one puts a gun to my head um, to clock in, despite what some socialist types say, or we're forced to work and things like that. But no one forces me to work, I uh, choose to. <laughs> so 99% of our lives is anarchistic. Yeah. And as, as Molyneux would say, we, we wouldn't have it any other way. Right. Even the most Stalinist, communist sort of, kind of person would not have it any other way which is kind of crazy when you consider you've got this tiny sliver this one percent the state where we insist that actually we don't want anarchy in that respect a very important respect <laughs> which is giving them the power to basically stick a finger in every orifice to, uh, to pardon <laughs> the phrase <laughs> <laughs> yes that's, that is a good point that that most people in yeah. in most of their lives they do live anarchistically and you know they, they make their own choices you know regarding yeah like you said um employment when to go to bed what to eat you know what spouse to you know partner with things like that and sure. uh, and if we were told if we were told what to do in those aspects of our lives we would you know see that as a violation um <laughs> right. look at it this way right um sorry, sorry to interrupt but no, look okay. at it this way imagine imagine if we had a fair redistribution of wives so <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i happen to be single right so say if uh, well adam's single so a load of other men that's not fair we need a fairer redistribution <laughs> of, of wives i mean would it work then you, everyone would be up and up you can't force people to marry adam <laughs> so but it, if it, it it's perfectly okay to apply that flawed logic to things like money yeah so right, exactly. if i you punish success, you raise taxes on the successful, that's a fair redistribution of wealth, as the phrase goes. Yeah. But if you apply that logic to anything else, just for people that, that you know that haven't been exposed to this kind of thinking, it, it, it's absolutely absurd. Like you say, would you redistribute women to men? Or would you, would you, <laughs> it's it's yeah. absolutely crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a, wonderful, that's a wonderful analogy. Because, yeah, it points to the absurdity of the whole of the whole idea <laughs> in that in that yeah taxes is, is essentially a punishment you know it's like it's like um if if you know we you know people who are liberal or democrat you know part of the occupy movement they want to tax the rich right because they're greedy and they got that money because they stole it from us you know and they want to tax it and give it to us um and and, and so basically yeah it's like you said it's a punishment for success mm-hmm. for being yeah. wealthy right um, because you know most people have this idea that the wealthy are somehow evil, and I guess it's mostly a Democrat thing. Um, Stole their wealth, <laughs> right? Right. So, whereas you know, you, I, we always have to make this distinction that, yeah, I mean, there, I guess there are there are wealthy people that have gotten their wealth illegitimately and through, let's say, crime and violence and things like that. But for the most part, most people that are wealthy uh, um, earn their wealth through providing a service or a good that people voluntarily purchased and enjoyed and actually enriched their lives. Like I'm happy that, that Bill Gates is a rich guy. I'm happy that Steve jobs when he was alive, it was a rich guy. I'm happy because he made my life better with all the technology that he made. You know, I have a Mm -hmm. MacBook, I have an iPhone. I'm happy, you know, he's made my life better. And, uh, (laughs) and so, you know, wealth is, wealth is, um, you know, it's a positive feedback. It's like you create something well, you benefit people's lives, and they pay you. That's the beautiful thing about free markets and yeah. capitalism. You know, it's a win-win. 
and and that's one thing that I always heard um, Stefan Molyneux you say, and it really it really stuck with me. You know, it's like you go buy a sandwich. You know, you have five dollars, and they have a sandwich. You know, they want they want your five dollars more than the sandwich, and you want the sandwich more yes. than your five dollars. Even trade, you're both happy, and you shake hands, and guess what? You both say thank you. It, that that's the ama- the other amazing thing about capitalism. Both people say thank you at the same time. They're both happy. <laughs> It's an, it's an amazing thing. It's 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 uh, they say, don't they? It's the single biggest contributor to the reduction in poverty right. in history. Right. The, the advent of capitalism. Yeah. Um, you look at look at an economy like China. Like you're an economist, so you you, you tell me. You look at a, a, a place like China where the middle class has just exploded. So you, it's the it just reduces poverty like no, no one's business really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's like I say. We live in a very strange world because we have these, like, like I was saying at the beginning, you have the something that's threatening to the state has to be tarred and has to be has to be blackened. So the word anarchy, mm. even you don't like to, to describe yourself as an anarchist, as, as you said before, because of the connotations. Of I mean, it, I, mean it? I, I after I give it that, um, you know, that preparation, then I say I, ah. I, I allow them to come to the conclusion as a result of all that. Yeah. I am an anarchist. Oh, cool. Then they understand it. And so, so, so I basically eliminate that initial shock factor <laughs> because I find yeah. sometimes that shock factor erects emotional ba- ba- uh, barriers that I, I just find it's just it just makes it unnecessarily difficult to to break through them um, intellectually, yeah. you know. So, I suppose I have if, if we're if we're using analogies in the you remember the film The Matrix. I, I've yeah. got more of a rougher. I just want to rip the jack out of the back of their head rather than just <laughs> eat it out, but. Uh, I, I suppose it's it's partly due to frustration. I'd, I, um, I'd like to see some kind of green shoots of anarchism rise up, at least while I'm alive. I'm actually a pessimist in respect to I don't believe that a free society is necessarily going to come about in, in, in our lifetimes. But I'd like to help build the foundations, if you like. Not to be a pessimist. I'm just I'm just saying it's given given that um, this the sort of the system that we're in at the moment, I think it's going to be very difficult, even with the internet and the spread of knowledge. But it's like, again, showing his influence now, like Stefan Molyneux says, it's a noble endeavour to, to try and spread the knowledge in these early stages. But hopefully it will happen in the future. We will have a uh, free society if, if peaceful parenting is encouraged, um, if uh, what I call voluntary affirmative actions are encouraged, so people just circumventing, mm. um, acting outside of the state, right. uh, doing things themselves, Agorism. taking responsibility for their own lives, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, Very bright I, future. Yeah, that's... Um, y- y- you heard the term agorism? Agorism? Agorism is basically what you just said, which is um, encouraging people, rather than like directly resisting the state, and, you know, maybe, I don't know... Um, protesting, marching, you know, directly resisting. Um, agorism is basically living your life outside the state, avoiding the state as much as possible, avoiding taxation. Don't send your kids to public school. Don't conduct your business in a way that the state sees, can see your business and can tax it. So basically avoid in every way that you can the state. That is the life of an agorist. Um, and, and one of the quotes um, that, I, that I like is... Um, a um a libertarian um let's say a libertarian understands the non aggression principle the um the anarchist um like enjoys the non aggression principle and the agorist lives the non aggression principle mm. and yeah, I, th- I thought that was that, i thought that's a very good um illustration of um you know and that's kind of what I tell people and actually what you said which is you know you said you're a pessimist um i don't s- I, I mean I kind of am, am the same as you, but I don't see myself as a pessimist because the way I look at it is it's irrelevant whether a, a, a free society happens or not, whether a voluntary society happens or not. Because it's, it's kind of the same way as like saying to an abolitionist in the 19th century, um, yes. you know, the, a society without slavery is not going to come in your lifetime. So you're just a utopian idealist. So stop yeah, even trying, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and to Definitely. me, that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're not going to live to see it. Um, all it matters is that that you're living, you know, you're stating your principles, what you believe in, and you, and and you um, you live by them, you know, and you live a noble and moral and kind and compassionate life, right? And hope, you know, through the spread of knowledge, through your book, through your YouTube channel, that other people sure. will learn and follow your way. 
and I think I think that's the best way that we can affect change is by em embracing and embodying this philosophy, mm -hmm. right, in our own life and in the way we raise our children, and and so in that way, slowly we are. <laughs> you can kind of say it's a kind of like eugenics. We're populating the world full of you know people who understand <laughs> property rights and self ownership. It's, and it's a good eugenics. It's a good eugenics, <laughs> right? Right. And, you know, people with through peaceful parenting were. were Raising people of the that's going to be uh, the adults of the future that understand these philosophies and that will promulgate them and um, and will really create um, a much more peaceful and uh, prosperous society. So so to me it's irrelevant whether or not it happens. It's like I, I, another another kind of analogy that I enjoy is I'm planting the seeds now for which we might not enjoy the shade mm. in our lifetime. Right. That's good, yeah. that, That's what we're doing. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll think I've heard that analogy before. You got the big oak and right. you won't enjoy the shade of the sh of the um, seeds, and that's a very nice quote. I would say, um, I think, I'm not sure whether it, I'm a pessimist. I'm a pessimist in terms of I don't think the actual society will happen. But I get what you're saying about the slavery analogy. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, and also the other thing is, um, my concern is not necessarily that it will happen or that it won't happen. All my concern is is that I'm living, um, I'm living a compassionate and moral life and a decent life. That's my concern, right? I can't control what other people do, right? We we can try to spread these ideas, we can try to influence people, but in the end, we can only control ourselves. And so, for me, that's it. And that's what I tell people: forget about you know. Some people get overwhelmed, like, well, it's never going to happen. We're never going to change people. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just focus on yourself. Okay, that's enough work for anyone to do. <laughs> Just focus on yourself. Yeah, sure. Improve yourself as a human being, and that will be one less person advocating for the legitimacy of the state. And 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 if that happens, I'm a happy man. <laughs> Indeed, this 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 is why we we fall when you talk about it, well when I talk about anarchism. Some people you inevitably fall back into this practicality crutch. So right. they always say, right. "Oh well, if you can't explain to me the price of." tuna in spring water in 70 years time in an Asda supermarket <laughs> oh well you can't explain that therefore it doesn't work and you think well no it's it's not it's not it's the mechanism itself it's not the it's right. not the details of the mechanism is it uh yeah actually i just heard a a recent video of stefan <laughs> molyneux just like today and he had a caller call it and basically the caller was basically asking him all the common status questions yeah. like how would regulations happen you know how would you regulate this business how would contracts be enforced without without state um mon you know monopolized courts you know how would this how would private police happen and and so he had to explain all this stuff how would education happen you know and and he was trying to but in the end it doesn't really matter like he didn't have to do he didn't have to explain it to this person because it's 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 kind of like asking the abolitionists you know if you can't explain to me how a society will work without slavery then what who you're the cotton? what you're saying exactly <laughs> who picked the cotton what you're saying is um invalid because you can't explain how the future will, how the future will pan out without slaves you know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to which he should, to which he should say he should say it doesn't matter all i know is Owning human beings is immoral <laughs> against their will. That's all that matters. That's it's a moral that, absolute. Yeah. That, that's all that's important. From there, we can find a way <laughs> to, to it's, survive. It's, again, a lot of the, I mean, I'm no economist. A lot of this is just common sense. You can think yeah. about it. People, oh, yeah. people act. You know, I explain this in my book. You don't have to know the ins and outs of a duck's ass. People act according <laughs> to in, incentives. Right. If if people want to feel secure in their society, if if they, if they want potable water, for example, if they want all of these goodies, mm. then of course the free market is going to provide those goodies. They, people act according to incentives. Right. Um, uh, without just because a state isn't there, that doesn't mean people are going to magically not need roads or access to work or um, a freight system to deliver their goods. That's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but this is the thing: people are so caught up in this in this kind of mentality. Well, if state, it's the fallacy of. Um, if state if the state provides X without the state X won't be provided. Right. It's a very basic fallacy, and yeah. it's it's just getting it's getting people past the the tuna example. Like if you can't tell me the price of tuna, etc., or if you can't tell me how the cotton would be picked after the slaves are emancipated, therefore, therefore it doesn't work. Well, that's ridiculous. It's it's the mechanism itself. It's it's the fact that people act according to incentives. Um, free market would be perfectly fine. <laughs> It'd be perfectly fine. You'd still have regulations. 
Um, of course you would. He, uh, businesses would self-regulate. Um, it's just, um, it's just, again, it's just common sense, isn't it? Would you would you want to eat in a restaurant where where the staff were licking the burgers before they're putting them in the buns? The, the, bit, the, the, the rest the restaurant would go out of business very soon as soon as people started spreading the word around. Don't go to Joe's right. and burgers. Exactly. It's self-regulation. You don't need a monolithic, exactly. great big state regulating things yeah and uh, yeah. and there's a great quote by frederick bastiat on this very topic which is he said like in 18, ah. 1850 which is like um you know people the socialists tend to think that without the state you know we can't have roads you know we we, <laughs> we uh you know we, we can't have maybe i don't know mail delivery but he's like if that's true then then does that mean that if the state doesn't raise grain then we're all going to starve is that <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> So it's just, it's just crazy. No, I think it. Um, he's talking about. I just think it's one of these, just one of these common sense things. It's, it all boils down to common sense. Um, people know, I think, instinctively that they're self-owning um, by demonstration. They know they're self-owning. I mean, um, for God's sake, we wouldn't have legal systems in every single society known to man yeah. if we didn't implicitly agree that everyone is self-owning. Because otherwise, why would we prosecute people for crimes? Because yeah. if if no one's self owning, they're not responsible for their actions. Therefore, <laughs> why would you, if they're just automat automatons that, exactly. that act according to no will yeah. or not uh, acting not according to their own will, yeah. then why are we prosecuting people for these yeah. crimes? So <laughs> every even the most communistic society that Kim Jong Un believes this, all of these every society known to man implicitly, whether they like it or not, agrees with self ownership and self ownership or sovereignty, as I call it is the basis for being an anarchist. So in a way, we're all, we're all anarchists because we all implicitly believe by demonstration that we're sovereign, we're self-owning. Right. And if that's the case, um, as I explain in my book, the burden of proof as to why the state can violate that sovereignty, violate that self-ownership, is with the statists. They have to explain it. This is another thing <laughs> I find quite remarkable, is people always turn it around and say, well, you have to justify why we can't have a state. And you go, mm. oh, hang on a minute, hang on. You have to justify to the anarchist why we need rulers, because people are, by demonstration, by, empirically speaking, you can see in the world that we're all self-owning individuals. Right. So the burden of proof is with the person making the claim. If, if, you, if you want to control my body, if you want to conscript me into your armies to kill other people, then mm. you've got to explain to me um, <laughs> what gives you justification to claim my body and my, my mind. It's, it's, a remote, it's, it's a very crazy world we live in, isn't it, Danilo? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like um, you know people have this idea they can't imagine you know how we would have roads, how we would have the post office, how yeah. how we would have you know I don't know whatever bridges it, it, without this entity that basically steals money from these people and then gives it to these people. Without that entity, we wouldn't have all these things. Like like with everything else, like like just take the um, the electronics industry, right? Almost pretty much unregulated, right? And how quickly has has that progressed and not only has the innovation and the technology improved but the price has plummeted right like uh, how many people that are considered poor below the poverty line in in america have smartphones have tvs <laughs> you know have all kinds of electronics that um you know weren't even in existence decades ago and as a result of having those they have access to the amount of information that would rival any library in history yeah. <laughs> you know and 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 that's basically as a result of an unregulated market and yet yeah. and yet we think if the government doesn't control the uh, the mailing of pieces of paper then everything's just going to crumble, <laughs> crumble. <Yeah. laughs> it's crazy it's absolutely crazy uh, and you think it's just a small what 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 I find very frustrating. It's a small leap of logic to say that if the dial is good, dialing it up that way, dial it up that way, get rid of the entire state, have yeah. a total free market. Yeah. Imagine how much more prosperous you could be then. I mean, imagine if you weren't paying. Imagine all the money that people pay in taxes, sales tax or, or VAT as we call it here, um, income tax. All of these, all of these, all of these different fingers in all of the different orifices. Um, <laughs> imagine if they were removed. Um, imagine the purchasing power that would increase in the economy. It, it'd be it'd be an explosion. It'd be a supernova of economic activity if you weren't um, paying the mafia its cut, so to speak.
I interviewed a guy uh, recently. You know, talk about that you're uh, that you're from England. I interviewed a guy called uh, Kevin Dixie from the um, No Other Choice. Um, he has another choice website um, and it's his business. He's basically a gun rights activist. He's a gun instructor uh-huh. and he talks about gun rights. And um, and what's fascinating is um, England basically has complete gun ban, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I've heard recently that now they're trying to ban knives, right? Have you heard this? <laughs> There is a, um, the <laughs> there, there have been various amnesties over the years. Basically, they put a big bucket, say, sh- chuck your knife in there. I think <laughs> you, there, there is a custodial sentence if you're caught carrying a knife um, by the police. They you you can you can go to prison. I think that's oh that coming a couple of years ago. <laughs> really? Pretty sure that's the case. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, I'm just just um, incidentally, I, I actually am an archer, so I I shoot a bow and arrow like, just ah. for target practice. Not yeah. not to hunt because yeah, obviously yeah. that's illegal in this country as well. But basically everything's illegal. Hunting in this is country. illegal in, in England. Yeah. Wow. you can't hunt with a bow and arrow. You can't hunt with a bow and arrow in this country or a crossbow or anything like that. But anyway, wow. um, I'm sure they'll probably ban that soon. Um, <laughs> oh they'll probably ban staring at people in a nasty way, look, like, because <laughs> um, it might have lethal effects, especially on leftists. Uh. Wait, 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 wait. So how are you supposed to hunt with like a pea shooter or like a like a BB <laughs> BB gun? How are you supposed to hunt? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, well, I think BB guns are, are still around. Uh, you, you can, in this country, I believe that um, you can use a shotgun if you have a shotgun certificate, but the vetting process obviously is, um, again, to use the phrase, ins and outs of a duck's ass. So the police have to go go, go down your, um, go into your house. Your ammo has to be separated from the gun. All of these different regulations to make wow. it as hard as possible. Wow. And it's usually people in the country that own shotguns. And I think... There's a license for a rifle as well, but as you said before, it's extremely regulated, so it's pretty much impossible right. for for a normal citizen to have, to own a firearm. Yeah, and and yet um, don't give co- it up, <laughs> Americans. Keep your guns, please. Right, and yet even though guns are so regulated and pretty much banned, um, the murder rate is like skyrocketing. I, I think is it from from what knives is like as a result. In London. Say again? It's rife in London. Knife crime is, is going up in London, I believe. It's, yeah. it's becoming endemic, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so they're banning knives. So what's going to be next? Banning hammers? Yeah. Banning what's <laughs> screwdrivers? <laughs> like, like, like so, so basically, if people want to kill other people, they're going to find a way. Or yeah, if they want to yeah. kill themselves, they're going to find a way, right? Yeah. And, and it's Someone what? could burst in right now and throttle me with these glasses, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, if it's the it's the evil intent behind the behind the instrument, not the. It's like if I put a gun on the table with no other human to interact with it, it's not going to randomly start shooting people <laughs> Jedi style, is it? So, but again, this is the fallacy of it all: is people people just can't think. I think uh, people just can't think critically, and it's it's quite a dangerous thing, really, isn't it? Because they're easily manipulated, um, and they they suffer these flaws in their logic. Um, I think if we had more critical thinkers, then I think we'd definitely have more anarchists. We'd definitely have more people um, who believe in voluntarism. I think, but it's a scary thing when you when you look around, you, you see people believe this kind of nonsense but yeah you're right it's it's the will behind the instrument it's not the instrument itself so right. you can ban every everything under the sun you're still gonna have crazy people out there right. who have mental breakdowns and want to hurt people right. it's a sad fact of life isn't it but the truly the truly uh sophisticated crazy person goes into politics right that's the that's oh, the, yeah. <laughs> the truly sophisticated <laughs> that is the loony bin that's where they gather them all the, so the, it, the politicians it's like um it's like it's the magnet for the scum the scum of society you know the scum magnet. rises to the top right like like lord of the rings you know you were saying how you're going to do some videos on lord of the rings you know the the um the uh, the state is uh you know the analogy the is the ring is the, is the state right the, the ring of power is the state sure. right and everybody yeah, everybody is drawn to it and everybody is corrupted by it and there's no way that you can use the state or the ring um in a way that's beneficial that can help people right huh. even though most wise the gandalf right he 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 didn't want to use the ring so refused it yeah right right so go, yeah, to, go, go ahead go ahead sorry pardon uh, sorry i didn't mean to no no go ahead go ahead go ahead 
I was just going to go. I'll find it. For, I'll, I'm looking into this at the moment. Tolkien is is it's highly fascinating. Like you say, even Gandalf mm-hmm. refused the ring. Yeah. Um, you can't use it. You can. It, Tolkien had a, a very interesting conception of evil. He didn't believe people were evil in and of themselves. What what makes a person evil is their, ironically enough, their good intentions. So even with the best intentions in the world, they say, oh, I want to... That's what Boromir, you know, the character of Boromir. Right, right. That's, originally, he wanted the ring to defend his people. Right, so he was right. wanted to defend Gondor. He said, I want to use this ring to defend my people. Right. But the problem is, that's what, that's what every... That's why politicians don't work. That's why the state doesn't work, because you get corrupted by the power. You get It goes to your head. Yeah. And... It, that's with any person. And that's it's, that's why I think there's such a close analog, uh, analogy between the the One Ring and statism because it mm-hmm. everyone desires it, everyone wants to use it, but no one can wield it, as you say, mm. you know, because it's got has this corrupting influence, and nothing good comes from force, and the ring symbolises power. So when nothing, you, you can't virtue doesn't spring from the barrel of a gun. Basically, <laughs> you can't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah. The way another way I kind of describe the state to people is like, um, you know, if you have a, you know, something wrong with your iPhone, and somebody brings a gun, tries to fix your iPhone, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or uh, you know, you're, or you're gonna play chess with somebody, and they they try to, they want to win, so they bring a knife, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's that saying, isn't it? You know, you know what beats a royal flush? A gun. Well, no, you just pull the gun out. Like, yeah, you win. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, sure. it, the application of violence is is never really a way to solve any complex, sophisticated intellectual problem <laughs> at all. It's 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 the choice of you know the lowly, the you know the vile, the wicked. You know, those are the people that choose to use violence to solve problems. Actually, that's another that's another line of questioning that you can I, I sometimes use with people, and I see other anarchists use, is when you just meet somebody, is you ask them, do you use violence to solve problems in your daily life? <laughs> and they say, no. You know, would you advocate other people use violence to solve your problems? No. How about a, a big group of you? Would you all you <laughs> advocate? Yeah. How about if you vote for a politician to use violence on your behalf? How, is that good? <laughs> So it's magically it becomes okay. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> At which point is the violence justified or does it change to becoming a moral action? And the answer is never. You know, so you see it goes um it goes deeper than just even sovereignty. So in the first part of the book I talk about consistency is a very basic thing. So do we prefer to be consistent in our thinking or do we prefer, ironically enough, an anarchy in it of inconsistency? Mm. So do we accept, like as you say, violence in our everyday lives? And and the answer for most people is we don't. Mm. So how is it right that the state can initiate violence? That's an inconsistency in our thinking. Yeah. Um, most people want to be consistent. So that's a whole section, a small section of the book um, that needs to be clarified for people because because some of these things they're so under the radar some of these ideas are um paradoxically speaking some of these ideas are so under the radar and so basic that that you can not see you can't see your nose to spite your face kind of thing (laughs) um so consistency is extremely important yeah and if we want to be consistent in our thinking and i think the most people do most rational people do then we can't have a state because a state is the ultimate initiation of the use of force yeah. we don't accept force in any other aspect of our life um therefore we shouldn't accept it in our governance <laughs> it's, it's you know it's very it's very simple really when you when you couch it in those terms <clears throat> yeah yeah another way i like to think about it or, or that has been told me which i really enjoy is um you know we interact with ourselves we, we are we are the um the ruler or the monarch of ourselves. So it's a monarchy of yeah. self and it's an anarchist, you know, in relation to others, anarchy in relation to others, which, yeah. which I really, I really enjoy that, um, that explanation. So, yeah. So what wonderful talking to you. So, um, before we go, please, um, you know, reiterate your, um, you know, your contact information, how people want to, uh, uh, if they want to follow you, how they get in touch with you or if they want to get your book, how do they, how do they get that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, the book, The Declaration of the South on the Abolition of the State, uh, available on Amazon, um, Amazon US, Amazon UK. Uh, the website is www.clarkad.co.uk. And the YouTube channel, I try to upload a video every day, um, probably every other day. That's just A.D. Clark 
on YouTube. Um, type that in, you should find me. Yeah, quite easy. Excellent, excellent. And uh, before we go, I always ask this of my guests: um, What is your favorite quote of all time? I, don't know. I've, I think I've got a good one, and it relates to statism in our system. Um, it's quite well known, and it's usually attributed to Albert Einstein. And it is: uh, insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that ties in with our electoral system. Um, <laughs> every now and again, we get a new idiot surprises, <laughs> um, right. find it like a polished turd, and we think that things are going to be different, and they never are. So right. there you go. <laughs> a useful idiot or a tool or a puppet or whatever you want to call them, a clown. <laughs> yeah. take, 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 still, take your pick. <laughs> all, all the essential ingredients still remain. They're still initiating the use of force. They're still using taxation and, re- and all of the nasty increments of the state. So right. in, in that sense, they're all, they're all the same, whether they're Republican or Democrat or Labour or Tory. So. Right. And, yeah. one, and one way you can uh, translate when you see a campaign, you know, politicians campaigning for office, just think what, whatever they're saying, whatever they, they say they want to do in office, just just say, just imagine them saying, I want to use the stolen funds to do X. <laughs> yeah. And then the other guy's like, no, 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 no. I want to use the stolen funds to do X. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to steal even more and give you even more. <laughs> All right. So where do you want the stolen funds to go? And all the anarchists are saying, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be stealing from each other. How about that? <laughs> yeah. can, we, can we, can we try that? Maybe. <laughs> okay. So not a, not a radical idea at all. So <laughs> probably be like, you don't like poor people. Right. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> what do you hate the poor? My God. Yeah. Oh my God. Start from, start from uh, square one. <laughs> so, uh, all right, cool. Wonderful, uh, wonderful conversation, Adam. Really enjoyed it. Uh, so yeah, please everyone check out his website, check out his book, Order his book. Um, it's a wonderful read. He's a he's a great writer. I think he illustrates the points and he explains them um, in great detail and uh, in, very clearly, very concisely. A lot of references to movies, right? Especially Lord of the Rings and different quotes and awesome stuff. My kind of book. Um, so I highly recommend it to uh, people. Yeah, check it out. Uh, the Declaration of the Self on the Abolition of the State. Yeah, awesome title. <laughs> so uh, wonderful talking to you, Adam. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so everybody, this is Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the Seeds of Liberty podcast, which is solpodcast.org and the Conscious Resistance Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.